Hello, my name is Michael Levy. I'm a co-director of the PASS course. The video you're about to watch is an excerpt from a course we developed specifically for Indian and other international CAs who will be writing the CFE in order to obtain their Canadian CPA. The course contains two components. One component is technical instruction. The other component is case writing instruction. This is an exam that is based purely on cases. So in addition to learning your technical, it is absolutely vital to get a good grounding in case writing. The excerpt you're about to watch will give you a good taste for what a CP case looks like and involves. And it'll also give you an idea of how PASS effectively teaches Indian CAs to write a CP case successfully. I hope you enjoy this video. I'd like to welcome everybody to the debrief of Perunco. Let me begin by explaining how I plan to take up the case. We're going to start by pulling out the required. We'll then discuss ranking and integration. We'll go over how to address the required. And then for some required, we'll talk about how to write up the case. And I'll use a sample response to demonstrate that. A large part of the sample response, however, I'll ask you to look at it on your own. And what I've done for the sample response is I've got copious comments on the response so that a large part of it, my feelings about the response will be pretty clear from the comments. So let's take a look at pulling out the required. And guys, please stop me at any point in time with questions. You know I welcome questions. If you don't mind, use your mic. If you need to, use the chat box. But please, if anything isn't clear, you need to tell me. Okay, when we pull out the required, the first required comes up in the third paragraph. As the selling price is based on the financial statements, he being Higgins wants to be sure there are no accounting errors that could impact the purchase price. In particular, he's concerned about the accounting for the discontinuance and disposal, notice discontinuance and disposal of the office furniture division. They refer to an appendix, which you would get to later, right? When you're reading the main body of the case, you're not flipping to appendices, you wait till you get to it. He therefore asks that you explain whether the accounting was correct, and if it was not correct, calculate the impact of any errors on the purchase price. So we've got to discuss the treatment for the discontinuous disposal of the division, and we're being told that if it was not correct, we also need to do quants. We need to quantify the impact of the error. As we mentioned this morning, you do need to be comfortable with you know, dealing with numbers in the area of financial accounting. Although he does not need you to do a formal valuation, he asks you for your opinion on whether the formula that's being used to establish the price for the shares provides him with a fair price. So the second required is, does a formula result in a fair price? What's tricky about this required is you know you're not supposed to do a formal valuation. You're being told not to, so you know you won't get credit for it. But the tough part is, what do I do? So we'll get to that when we take up that required. He also asked you to discuss the impact of selling a share of his business to a consortium of investors on how he runs the business. So that's the next required. Here they give you a little bit of background information. And then in this paragraph here, the third to last paragraph, they come down to the required. Let's take a look at the required together. Higgins asks you, to determine what qualitative factors he should consider in making a final decision with regard to A, selling over the internet, and B, working with IMF, IMI. Obviously, I inserted the A and B. I was just trying to point out to you that you can have a one sentence required with two parts to it. And it's absolutely critical that you address both parts. There's not necessarily going to be an A or a B. He also asked for your thoughts on whether selling over the internet and working with IMI is a good fit with Fernco's mission. And then they go on to give you the mission statement. The mission is to provide timely delivery and reliable service with a personal touch. So we're gonna have to discuss whether selling over the internet and working with IMI is a good fit with the mission. Higgin also wants you to calculate whether the claim made by IMI that they can increase Fernco's profit by at least a million bucks is reasonable. That's another requirement. So at the end of the day, we have a lot of requires. Overall, we've got six requires to deal with. Now, is this a lot of requires to deal with in 90 minutes? Yes. 
Is this at all unusual on the CP? No. Those of you who've seen day three cases already know that they have a lot of requires within a very short time. The big challenge on day three, in my opinion, is the time constraints, the ability to get through all the required. So my cases have a lot of requires. That's intentional. It's meant to be reflective of the real CP where you have many requires to deal with within a short period of time. Let's talk now about integration. You may recall when we did case writing techniques, I emphasized <clears throat> that before you start typing, you should always ask yourselves, how are the requires intertwined? Because if they are intertwined, it can impact the sequence in which you attack the case. So let me tell you where I thought the integration lay in this particular case. Required number one, where you're dealing with accounting, is clearly intertwined with required number two, where you're determining whether the purchase price is fair, as the accounting errors impact the purchase price. I need to do required one first, figure out if there are errors. If there are errors, I need to quantify the errors and come up with a revised purchase price. I can't consider whether the purchase price is fair until I've revised it, because the revised purchase price may be very different than the original purchase price. So I need to do one, figure out what the accounting errors are, come up with a new revised purchase price if the income before Disney operations changes, because that's the driver of the purchase price. And then I take my revised price and consider whether it's fair and required to. So impossible to do two, one, it's impossible to do two before one. You gotta do one before two. Another area, I'm just gonna make up a word that doesn't really exist. Another area of intertwinement, please don't use that in real life, it doesn't exist. Um, another area of intertwinement is between requireds three and four. In required three, you're being asked to consider the impact of new owners. In required four, you're being asked to give advice, refactors to consider before making a decision about selling over the internet and working through the, an intermediary. Can anybody see why the two might be intertwined? Can you just give it your best shot, anybody? Please don't be shy, really, there's no wrong answer here, really. Anybody, can anybody see why they're intertwined? The, the reason why I would think they're intertwined is maybe the new owners aren't interested in selling over the internet. It would make no sense to take on new owners and then take the company in a direction that's completely different from what they want. Maybe they want a brick and mortar type operation. I realize that Higgins still legally has control, but it makes no sense to take on a significant new ownership, you know, to have 28% of your shares owned by other people and then do something that they hate. That's just not gonna work, right? It's just not gonna fly. So at the end of the day, that's why I thought the two were intertwined. That, that, that you know, basically he's gotta make sure the new owners buy into the idea of selling over the internet and, as opposed to a brick and mortar type operation. Finally, required number four, where you're dealing with selling over the internet and working through IMI is inextricably intertwined with required number five, where you're tying back to the mission statement. Because at the end of the day, in considering the factors that need to be considered for selling over the internet and working with IMI, you'll need to take into account the mission statement. So as I look at the possibility of selling over the internet, and I ask myself, what are the factors I need to consider? And the same thing goes for working with IMI. I'll do it within the context of the mission statement. Some students may have even regarded four and five as one large required and simply address them together. I'm just curious, did any of you look at what I called four? Did any of you guys, any of you look at four and five as one big, one big required? I'm just curious. If you did, just throw a yes into the chat box. Anybody? Yeah, good. I see a number of you did. Very normal. I'll be honest with you. Whether you looked at four and five as one big required or you looked at them as two required makes no difference because they're very intertwined. So at the end of the day, personally, even if I looked at four and five as two required, I would have addressed them together anyhow because they're so intertwined. Now let's talk about ranking. I said earlier on a typical multi, you have many requires to deal with within a relatively short period of time. So your ability to rank and come up with an optimal time allocation, I think is a critical success factor for this exam. I would have allocated for this 90 minute question about 25 minutes to read the case and plan it, leaving over about 65 minutes to write the case. You may recall from case writing techniques 
that we normally spend about a quarter of our time, give or take a few minutes, reading and planning the case, and approximately three quarters, give or take, writing up the case. That's a good ratio most of the time, because if you spend too much time reading the case, you won't have enough time to write the case. Now, how many of you, I'm just curious, at this stage of the game, how many of you had difficulty reading this case and planning it in, in 25 minutes or less? How many of you had, a pro had difficulty with that? I'm just curious, put a yes if you did. Really, most of you didn't have difficulty? Surprise. Okay, that's great. What I was going to say, and maybe I'm anticipating incorrectly, I had anticipated that many of you would have had difficulty just because at this stage of the game, many people's reading speed is nowhere near where it's going to be in September. So I know that when I was in early July, my reading speed was much slower than September, simply because I hadn't written enough practice cases yet. By the time you finish Capstone 2 and you've written a ton of past CPs in addition to the past cases, your reading speed should increase quite a bit. So if there's anybody here who did have trouble getting the reading done within about 25 minutes, I'm telling you now it's not necessarily an issue because your reading speed should increase dramatically as you get more practice. Let me show you how I would have broken down my time between the requires based on my ranking. The first required was basically dealing with the accounting treatment for the discontinuance and disposal of the division. And there were really two issues that arise. One is the issue of a discontinued operation. Is the office division a discontinued operation? And the other one was, as we'll see in a few minutes, there really was a contingent gain on the disposal of the division, right? The contingent gain comes up, in case people don't know what I'm talking about, on, page, on Appendix 2 at the, in the very last paragraph, where they seem to have recognized the $150,000 that's really contingent on sales achieving a certain level. So those are really the two issues relating to discontinuance and disposal of the division. There was a lot of room for depth with regard to the discontinued operation. You knew that you needed to spend a lot of time on that because you have a lot of case facts to work with. We said this morning, that if you've got two accounting issues, you don't always spend the same amount of time on both. For the contingent gain, there's not a huge amount to talk about. There aren't a huge number of facts to work with. So I would have spent minimal time. But when it comes to the Disney operation where I have a lot of facts to work with, I would have spent a great deal more time. So I would have spent about 10 to 15 minutes dealing with the accounting relating to the discontinuance and disposal of the operation with a disproportionate amount of my time being spent on the discontinued operation. For required number two, determining whether the purchase price is fair, there are some quants involved because you need to compute the purchase price after correcting for errors. You also need to compute the fair value of net assets being purchased. We'll see why later on when we take up the issue. But what made this not all that time consuming is the fact that no formal business valuation was being asked for and you were being told explicitly not to do it. So you knew you shouldn't. There was some number crunching, but it's a lot less involved than the number crunching you would have needed to do for required number six in order to validate that million dollar claim. There's mil very minimal qualitative for this required. It's mainly quantitative. It'll fall under the finance required. I would have said about 10 to 15 minutes. I don't think you need more time than that. I think many people could have done it in 10 minutes because there's not a huge amount of number crunching and there's not a huge amount of qualitative. Required number three, the impact of selling the shares and running the business. There are a number of key issues that need to be dealt with, but not a huge amount of work to do. Therefore, it will not take a lot of time to write up as long as you're concise. And we talked about this during case writing techniques. The name of the game is getting your point across in as few words as possible. If you can do that, this is a required that should not take you very long because there really aren't a huge number of issues to deal with. This would fall under strategy and governance. I'd say about five to 10 minutes for this issue. Requires four and five, required four was selling the issues, the <clears throat> factors around selling over the internet and working with IMI. That was four. Five was tying back to the mission. So I would have come up with a time budget for requires four and five together, given that I was, we discussed earlier, they're very much intertwined. Uh, the bottom line is that I would, I would have, whether I look at them as one required or Two requires, either way, as we said earlier, I would have dealt with them together. So I would come up with one budget for four and five together. It was very important to pay close attention to the fact that there were two parts to required number four. 
selling over the internet and working with IMI, it was important to deal with both. Fair number of case facts to work with. I think you'd all agree in the appendices, you had a fair number of facts to work with. The tie back to the mission statement, not time consuming at all, as we'll see later on. This will definitely fall into strategy and governance. Tying back to a mission statement is classic strategy and governance. I'd say about 10 to 15 minutes for this required. Required number six is validation of the claim regarding the profit increase. What you're gonna to need to do is a number cruncher here. You're gonna to need to project the increase in profits through working with IMI. Now, the calculation is fairly involved. Quite a few numbers were provided. Quants by their very nature are more time consuming than qualitative. We talked about this when we did numerical methods, just no way around that. So bottom line is I think you need a solid 20 minutes for this just because there's fairly major quants involved. No surprise that this falls under management accounting. Management accounting is usually where the mega number crunching tends to lie. Any questions before we take up our first required? First required I'd like to take up is the accounting. Any questions before we get to that? And please don't be shy. If there's something on your mind, you need to share it with me. Nothing? Okay. So let's take a look then at the accounting. In approaching each of the accounting issues, make sure to conclude on whether it, the issue was dealt with correctly or not. If the treatment was not correct, you're going to need to consider the impact of the error on the financial statements and in particular on income before designated operations, given that that's the figure that drives the purchase price. A lot of work is involved for the discontinued operation issue, since as I mentioned before, you've got lots of information to work with, and therefore there's lots of room for depth. Therefore, I would spend you know, a disproportionate amount of time on this accounting issue versus the contingent gain. The key to getting depth, as we know from this morning, is tying the technical and the case facts. The more case facts I tie back to, the more successful I'm gonna be. So what I'm gonna do for this issue is I'm gonna do a super quick, under one minute crash course on discontinued operations. Once we all know discontinued operations inside out, with, I'll then show you how easy it is once you know your technical to tie the technical into the case facts. Those of you who've watched or the past technical videos or even just read the past technical binder may recognize this slide because this is from the technical notes that I provided to PwC. Let's take a look at the conditions for having a discontinued operation. Number one, they relate to a component of an enterprise. So if I have an operation that was disposed of, step number one, it must qualify as a component. A component comprises operations and cash flows that can be clearly distinguished operationally and for financial reporting purposes. I need to deal with both in a case from the rest of the enterprise. So that's step number one. So office cannot be considered a discontinued operation unless it qualifies as a component. Otherwise, a division by definition cannot be discontinued. The next thing is the operation has either been disposed of or is classified as held for sale. Notice, guys, that in order to have a discontinued operation, either you dispose of the operation before the end of the period, or as at the end of the period, the operation qualifies as held for sale. One of those two conditions must be met. Now, in our particular case, we don't have to worry about whether the operation qualified as held for sale at the end of the period because the disposal took place prior to year end. Year end is December 31st and the sale took place December 27th. Had the sale taken place post year end, say the sale had taken place 15 days after year end, we could still treat it as discontinued if it meets all the conditions, but we'd have to be able to reclassify it at year end as held for sale. Because it took place prior to year end, we don't have to worry about the held for sale conditions. Once you've met conditions one and two, take a glance, guys. You then simply need to meet one of these three conditions. Not all, but just one. Take, take a glance at these conditions, and then I'm going to show you how to tie back to the technical. I'll just give you a few seconds to glance at this, just to refresh your memory. You now know everything you need to know to deal with this issue. Had the sale taken place post year end, 
You'd also have to know the conditions for held for sale. But because the sale took place prior to your end, you don't have to worry about that. So let's pull the case facts out of the case, and then let's try to tie back to the guidance. Most of the case facts you needed were in Appendix 2. We're told that during 020, Higgins made the difficult decision to discontinue the manufacturing of office furniture. So that was a good clue that this could potentially be a discontinued operation. Therefore, on December 27th, 020, they sold office to Optimum, a company that sells furniture exclusively. So a good clue that I'm dealing with a discontinued operation is the fact that they discontinued the division by basically selling it. They're no longer, that they've discontinued that operation by selling it, they're no longer going to be, no longer gonna have an office furniture division. Division was sold December 27th, prior to year end. Prior to the sale of office, office being the office division, right? Office, for, office is short for office furniture. Many assets were shared between divisions. For example, most of the larger equipment was used by both divisions. Furco's manufacturing staff comprised the majority of the workforce and were combined with most manufacturing employees working on both residential and office furniture. Separate divisional financial statements were prepared for each division. So notice they've given us a fair amount of information in this paragraph. We'll see in a few minutes how you could easily tie this back into your technical. As the company will no longer be involved in office furniture, <clears throat> the net loss after tax of 158,600 was treated as a loss from discontinued operations in the financial statements. So they're giving you the impact of treating, number one, they're telling you that they treated the loss as being from discontinued operations. So you're gonna have to decide whether that was correct or not. And if it wasn't, that would be an error that needs correcting for, for the purpose of calculating the purchase price. Number two, they've given you the figure to work with in case you need to make an adjustment. If you decide this is not a discontinued operation, you now know the magnitude of the adjustment. When you go to Appendix 4, they gave you a breakdown between residential and office furniture sales. Now, notice that the office division sales are only 20% of sales. So I'm just noting over here the need to use data analytics information from the appendix that related mainly to another required. Let me explain what I mean by that. Many people would not have used, I think, would not have used this information for the discontinued operation because this information comes up in Appendix 4, and Appendix 4 is primarily relating to other requires. So a lot of students would have only picked up the information that came up in the main exhibit where discontinued operations comes up. But you may recall from this morning, guys, that I actually said to you that the Board of Examiners has explicitly said in the CP report that we're purposely not going to put all the information always in one place. We're purposely going to scatter it a little bit. So students have to realize that not all of the information that relates to an issue will be in the same appendix where the issue comes up. So you kind of have to work backwards. You have to go through the conditions in your mind and then try to find the case facts that you can utilize anywhere they may be, anywhere they may be in the case. What I want to show you now, and maybe with your help, I hope, is how to tie the, the case facts we just picked up into the technical. So let's do this together. The fact that the division was sold on December 27th, we know already that that's important because before we can treat something as discontinued, either it was sold before your end or we're able to reclassify it as held for sale. We know that given that December 27th is prior to your end, we don't have to worry about held for sale. We've met condition two. Now, the fact that the office division accounts for 20% of sales. Can anybody tell me what we can tie back to? When you look at this slide here, can you see something you can tie back to? Please give it a shot, somebody. Please don't be shy. <clears throat> a separate major line of business. Excellent. Excellent. Maham, right? You're the one who just said that. Am I correct? Yep. Yeah. I, got, and I think I pronounced your name correctly, right? So Maham basically said, what she would have tied back to is the fact that it's a major line of business, right? Now, the bottom line here is, in case anybody's wondering, is there a particular threshold as to what major is? Neither ASPI or IF, nor IFRS 
gives you a specific percentage. But I would think 20% is certainly a major line of business. All they're trying to do here is they're trying to say, if I owned an operate, if my company had an operation that only accounted for 3% of sales and I disposed of it, it's probably not major enough to bother with in terms of treating it as discontinued. But 20%, I think everybody would agree, is pretty major. Now, again, I just want to reiterate the point that I mentioned earlier. The way we would have picked this up, as you know, was from that the data analytics uh, that we were given right here, right? But, but, and then, they, by the way, whenever they give you graphic information like this, this is considered, by the way, data analytics. So I would have picked up this 20% from this appendix right here. And again, as I mentioned before, one way to avoid missing this point, even though it comes up in a different appendix from the rest of the information, is by working backwards. So I would have said to myself, I know that I need to tie back to these conditions. So I'm looking for case facts I can use to tie back to these conditions. So when I get to Appendix 4, I would have said to myself, great, I just found the case fact I can tie back to to demonstrate that it's a major line of business. Any questions before we go further? OK, let's continue then. The next case facts are the ones in, I'm not great with colors, but I think this is turquoise. If I'm wrong, please correct me. Feel free to correct me. I wouldn't mind learning my colors properly. I must have been absent in, in kindergarten that day, but I think this is turquoise. The bottom line here is how can we use these case facts? If you go back to this, how can we use the case fact that I have in blue? Anybody? What does it tie back to? Give it a shot, guys, please. Nobody has any idea? The fact, okay, let, maybe let's look at these two first. The fact that the assets are being shared, the fact that the employees are combined, you don't see at all where it could tie in here, anywhere here? Oh, excellent. Uh, what's your, I don't know what your name is, but somebody put in the chat box whether it's a separate component. Excellent, I agree 100%. The bottom line is a component comprises a component comprises an operation that's distinguishable operationally and for financial purposes. So I would argue that if they're sharing staff, right? They're, they're sharing employees. They're also sharing assets. Bottom line is it probably is not operationally distinct. On the other hand, they've got separate divisional financial statements. That would mean that they are distinguishable for financial reporting purposes. So that is exactly why you were given that information. Very good. Now, the last point is divisional loss of 158,600, which was treated as a loss from Disney unit operations. So now they're giving me the impact of the accounting treatment of financial statements. If we determine at the end that the loss should not have been treated as discontinued, then we know the adjustment we're gonna to need to make which will, of course, impact the purchase price, which is based on income before discontinued operations. What I'd like to show you now is an example <clears throat> of a student sample response. And I think you'll like it. I mean, I liked it. Bottom line is it's not perfect, but it doesn't need to be perfect. But it's very strong. It's more than, it's more than competent, quite frankly because the student does all the right things. So even though he doesn't do it perfectly, he does the right things. And you'll see what I mean. Let's start. This case starts off, this case is of, operate, of, of office furniture division. So notice my first comment. Spends a lot of time on this issue, so that's a good start. He realizes he's got a lot of case facts to work with, and this warrants time. The key issue is whether the office furniture division is a discontinued operation, as this will impact the purchase price, which is based on income before the operations. As per handbook section 347503E, you don't really need to quote the section number, by the way, the marker doesn't care. A discontinued, so he could have just said, as per the handbook, a discontinued operation is defined as follows. Now, notice he copied this from the handbook, which is fine, is a component of an enterprise that either is being disposed of by sale, abandonment, or spin off, or is classified as held for sale. So he copies this from the handbook and then he ties back to a case fact. In the case of office division, it was disposed of by sale prior to your end. Good tie back to case facts. You don't need to say anything more than that. And then he copied the three conditions that I showed you on the earlier slide. 
And let's see how he ties back to it. First condition was separate line of business or geographical area of operations. So look how he ties back. He ties back like Maham did. Given that the office division constituted 20% of the sales of the company, this is me talking, good use of case, anything in bold is me talking, good use of case fact, it does represent a separate line of business, therefore this condition is met. Do you remember this morning, I said to you that one of the complaints of the Board of Examiners is sometimes people will say net without explaining why it's met tying back to case facts. Nobody could accuse the student of that. The student explains very clearly why it's met tying back to case facts without wasting a lot of words. This is exactly what I'm looking for. The student doesn't tie back to number two, but does tie back to number three. Number three says is a sub acquired exclusively with a view to resale. Notice my comment here, and notice what the student then says. We are dealing with a division, not a sub, therefore not applicable. Notice my comment here, worth indicating that not applicable. The bottom line here is if I had never seen a capstone guide, if I didn't know how CPA Canada marks this exam, you know what I would tell you? I would tell you if something's not applicable, no need to say anything. It's a waste of your time. That's what I would have said. But once you see the way CPA Canada marks these exams, you start to realize that as illogical as it may be, you actually do get credit for tying back to conditions, even conditions that are not applicable. So for simply explaining why a condition is not applicable, you hit a point on the evaluation guide. And as we said this morning, we're not trying to prove we're great accountants on this exam. We're trying to write toward a guide. We want to hit points on a guide. So I know there are going to be points for doing this, for explaining why it's not applicable, so I do so. At the end of the day, I would say that this was an excellent tieback of handbook guidance to the rules. Bottom line is he, our candidate didn't tie back to one of the conditions, but the response is still very good. Also, note that even though only one of the above conditions need to be fulfilled, it still pays to tie back to all of the conditions if possible. On the Fernco guide, which we'll see later on, which was based on a CP guide when disking operations came up on the CP, to get competent, it turns out you needed to tie back to at least two of these conditions. So at the end of the day, if you only tie back to condition one, that wouldn't be enough to get competent. In real life, I would only tie back to condition one because I only need to meet one condition. But this is CP like where I'm trying to hit a guide. Also note that the student copied from the handbook, which I think was efficient because there are a number of conditions. When there are a number of conditions, it can be very efficient to copy rather than paraphrase it all in your own words. Okay, now let's continue. Before it is possible to treat the office division as a discontinued operation, it must also qualify as a component. A component comprises operations that are not, that are distinguishable, excuse me, operationally and for financial purposes from the rest of the company. So here's my comment. I said, note that the student paraphrases the definition of component rather than looking it up in the handbook and copying it verbatim. This would be perfectly fine because the student has captured the essence of the division of the definition. The essence of the definition is distinct operationally and distinct from a financial reporting perspective. As long as you capture that, you get the thrust of what the handbook says across, doing it in your own words is fine. Given that it's only going to take me, you know, 30 seconds or less to say this in my own words, why waste time going to the handbook, looking for it, and then copying it? You don't get any extra points for quoting it verbatim. So it's only worth doing that if it will save you time. Or if you don't know. If you don't know, you have to go back to the handbook. Here is where the candidate does a splendid job of tying back to case facts. On the one hand, separate divisional financial statements are prepared. Therefore, they can be distinguished for financial reporting purposes. However, more significantly, most of the larger equipment is also shared between divisions. And the office division does not have its own manufacturing workforce. Combined manufacturing staff for both divisions and manufacturing staff are probably the majority of the workforce. These two points would indicate that the office division is not distinguishable operationally, therefore the definition of component not met. Beautiful, beautiful use of case facts. Tied back to the guidance. Once again, there's no way in the world that, we, that the board of examiners would accuse the student of saying whether a condition is met without adequate explanation. The explanation is excellent, beautiful tie back to case fact. Also, 
the candidate clearly concludes on whether the definition is met rather than assuming it is implicit from the discussion. Sometimes people are not overly explicit in concluding. Do you remember we said that sometimes there are different steps you need to go through on an issue, and it's a good idea to conclude along the way. We still haven't come to the final conclusion as to whether this is discontinued or not, but one of the steps we needed to go through was determining whether it's a component. So it's worth coming to sub-conclusions as you finish with a step. Here's, here's a final conclusion as to whether this is discontinued, as the, whether this division is discontinued or not. As the office division does not qualify as a component, it would not be a discontinued operation. Accordingly, the income from the office division should be reclassified and treated as income from continuing operations, which will reduce the income before discontinued operations. So I said over here, excellent, the candidate concludes on whether the office division constitutes a discontinued operation, and they give the impact on the statements, which will be important for recalculating the purchase price. So at the end of the day, these are my comments. I said good in-depth discussion, technically correct. If this is not at the discuss level, I frankly don't know what is. <clears throat> Let's now take a look at the evaluation guide. The first part of the guide deals with the, you know how you have to meet one of those three conditions? So these are the three conditions listed in the handbook. Notice it says partial if two attempted or one discussed. Yes, if two discussed. So this is what I meant earlier when I said to you that if our candidate had only tied back to this and said, you know what, I've already, you only have to meet one condition, the game, you know, no need to go further. In real life, they're right, but they wouldn't have been competent because it turned out you have to tie back to at least a couple of these items. So by explaining why the condition regarding the subsidiary is not applicable, they got an X here, and now they have enough points. For a component, it was very important. In order to get a yes, you needed to discuss whether the division is distinguishable both operationally and for financial reporting purposes. You had enough facts to do that. Provides a conclusion on whether the office division is a component. So this would be the sub-conclusion that we talked about. Provides an overall conclusion on whether the office furniture division is discontinued. Coming to that overall conclusion on the issue, absolutely vital. Explains the impact of the adjustment on the financial statements of no longer treating the office furniture division as discontinued. Again, always important to give the impact, but particularly in this case, where we're trying to recompute the purchase price. Let's take a look at what you needed to do to get competent. Our student actually got CD, but I don't think we care much about what you need to do to get CD because we're aiming for competent. So let's take a look at what you needed to do to be competent. We'll look at only what, let's look at what's in the brackets because that's really what's dear to our hearts. That's what we care about. Yes on both the discontinued operation and component. So you needed a yes on one and two. And yes on conclusion as to whether it's a discontinued operation. The final conclusion on the issue is always going to be critical for getting competent. You have to come to a conclusion. Is this a discontinued operation or not? Now let's take a look at Contingent gain. Any questions, by the way, in the discontinued operation? Okay, let's look at the contingent gain. For the contingent gain, it says the company recognized $150,000 contingent gain from the sale of office division. The gain is a contingent gain as it is uncertain whether Furco will receive the 150 as they must meet a sales threshold of $2 million in order to earn the 150, and this may not occur. Just to make sure that people understand, in the, second, in the very last paragraph of Appendix 2, they told you that they sold the division for 150 k less than book value. But there was $150,000 of, of um, remuneration that was contingent on the sales meeting this $2 million target. It then goes on to say, because Higgins is confident OI could achieve the sales of over $2 million, they didn't book a loss on the sale of the division. So isn't that the same thing as saying they booked the contingent gain? Because without recognizing the 150, which was contingent on sales reaching a certain level, they would have had a loss of 150. By not recognizing the loss, they're effectively recognizing the 150. But the 150 is a contingent gain. So our student does a very nice job of explaining this, right? The candidate explains very clearly that they recognize the $150,000 contingent gain. And they explained very clearly why it's a contingent gain. Then the candidate says, as per the handbook, 
one is not allowed to recognize a contingent gain. Once again, it made a lot more sense to paraphrase from the handbook. It would have been a colossal waste of time to go back to the handbook, copy one sentence into your paper. That's a waste of time. Finally, the candidate concludes very clearly, therefore it was incorrect to recognize the contingent gain. I'll let you read these comments on your own. I really don't have much to add to them. Let's take a look now at the evaluation guide. When you look at the evaluation guide for the contingent gain, explains the, treat, the issue treating the rumination for the sale of the division as a contingent gain. Our candidate clearly explained why this was a contingent gain. And then you needed to basically recognize from a technical perspective, you needed to know your technical, you needed to make it very clear that you're not allowed to recognize contingent gains, right? And it doesn't matter, by the way, how probable it is. It doesn't matter if there's a 96% chance they'll exceed the sales level. It's irrelevant. It's still contingent. In terms of the definition of discuss, technically correct discussion of the issue, incorporating case facts, our students certainly did that. Provides a conclusion on whether to recognize the gain. As you know, you always need to conclude. And then finally explains the impact on the statements. Our candidate did not do that. The candidate provides a reasonable, in terms of what you need to do to be competent, candidate provides a reasonable discussion of the accounting treatment for the contingent gain. You needed a yes on number one and a yes on conclusion. Before we take our break, are there any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, can we just take a break, please, until uh, quarter to four, and then we'll do the final stretch, okay? We hope you enjoyed watching this excerpt. If you'd be interested in seeing the remainder of this take-up session, as well as many other case writing sessions offered in this course, please feel free to register. If you are not already on our website, to register, please visit our website, pastyourcpa.ca. Put your cursor over the CP module courses at the top of the screen, and then click on CP Indian and other international CAs, and you can then register electronically. If you'd like to ask any questions or make any inquiries, if you're living in Canada or anywhere else in the world other than India, please feel free to contact myself, Michael Levy, or my partner, Ira Walfish, We've given you here contact information, as you can see. We're reachable both by phone as well as WhatsApp. We're also reachable through Skype. If you're living in India, please contact our affiliate, Orbit. And again, on this slide, you can see the contact information for Orbit. We look forward to seeing you in the past course.